This is Unsung History, the podcast where we discuss people and events in American history that haven't always received a lot of attention. I'm your host, Kelly Therese Pollack. I'll start each episode with a brief introduction to the topic and then talk to someone who knows a lot more than I do. Be sure to subscribe to Unsung History on your favorite podcasting app so you never miss an episode. And please, Tell your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, maybe even strangers to listen to. Today's episode is the second in our four-episode detour to British history. We'll be discussing the fascinating Henrietta Maria, Queen of England, Scotland, and Ireland in the 17th century. Henrietta Maria was born in Paris on November 25th, 1609. She was the youngest daughter of the Bourbon king, Henry IV of France, and his second wife, Marie de Medici. When Henrietta Maria was not quite six months old, her father was assassinated by a fanatical Catholic monk, even though Henry himself had converted from the Huguenot faith to Catholicism. Marie de' Medici became regent for Henrietta Maria's nine-year-old brother, Louis XIII. As a child, Henrietta Maria saw her older sisters married off to other royal families in order to strengthen alliances. Her oldest sister, Elizabeth Valois, married Philip IV of Spain, and her sister, Christine of France, married the Prince of Savoy. When Henrietta was only 12, her own future was being decided via negotiations between the English and French courts. When she was 15, they agreed that Henrietta Maria would go to England to marry Charles, the oldest son of King James I. Just days after the treaty was finalized, James I died on March 27, 1625 and Charles ascended to the throne as Charles I. Charles and Henrietta Maria were married via proxy on May 11th in Paris. It wasn't until June 23rd, when Henrietta Maria arrived in England, that the two were physically together. The coronation ceremony for Charles took place the next February. But as a devout Catholic, Henrietta Maria could not participate in the Protestant service. She watched from a distance as her husband was crowned. She was never crowned herself. Despite their differences and the arranged nature of their marriage, Henrietta Maria and Charles fell in love and grew closer to each other. Henrietta Maria gave birth to nine children. The first was a stillborn boy. The next child was a son who would become King Charles II, followed by Mary, who married the Prince of Orange, James, who would later become King James II, Elizabeth, Anne, Catherine, Henry, and finally Henrietta, who was also called Minette, and who would later marry Philippe I. Duke of Orleans, the younger brother of the Sun King, Louis XIV. Henrietta Maria loved to put on plays and masks at the royal court, elaborate entertainment of the sort she was used to at the French court. However, these entertainments were not as welcome among the Puritan subjects of England who found the Catholic Henrietta Maria shocking. From the beginning of their marriage, Henrietta Maria's Catholicism caused problems in Protestant England. Their marriage treaty had included, at the request of the French, certain guarantees that Henrietta Maria could continue to worship as a Catholic, that she could have a Catholic chapel open to worshippers wherever she resided, and freedom for any English Catholics who had been imprisoned for their religion. Although Charles told Parliament that he'd signed only for the Pope's approval of the marriage, 
and that he had no intention of following through on most of the agreement. Religion wasn't Charles's only problem. He had a rocky relationship with Parliament from the start, which was exacerbated when Charles dissolved Parliament to save his favorite, George Villiers, the Duke of Buckingham, whom Parliament had begun to impeach in 1627. Charles called Parliament again in 1628 in order to raise funds, and Parliament required him to sign the Petition of Right, a document that set out individual protections against the state, including saying that the military couldn't be put up in a private home without the owner's consent, and that only an act of Parliament could compel an individual to pay taxes. Charles, like his father, James I, believed he had been chosen by God and that he had a divine right to rule. For the next decade, he refused to call Parliament again, reigning by personal rule, or by tyranny, as his detractors said. In order to quell a rebellion in Scotland, Charles eventually had to recall Parliament in 1640 but he dissolved it again after only a few weeks when they refused to fund the invasion. He invaded Scotland anyway and suffered a defeat. Desperately needing funds, he reluctantly called Parliament again in November 1640. This Parliament was hostile to Charles, and they began to pass laws limiting the king's powers, leading to a series of wars, collectively called the English Civil War although they also included Ireland and Scotland, which were united under a single king. The wars lasted nearly a decade. I'll discuss Henrietta Maria's actions during the English Civil War with our guest today. On January 30th, 1649, King Charles I was beheaded by decree of Parliament. An impoverished Henrietta Maria moved to France where she took solace in her Catholic faith. In 1651, she founded a convent in Cheyot, where she lived for much of the decade. Royalist forces were finally defeated in 1651, and for a brief period of time, power in England was held by the Republican government. However, in 1653, Oliver Cromwell became Lord Protector essentially a dictator, until his death in 1658. Cromwell's son, Richard, took over after his death, but his rule was brief. In May 1660, Henrietta Maria's oldest son, Charles II, returned with the consent of Parliament, and he was crowned on April 23, 1661. Henrietta Maria returned to England in October 1660, along with her youngest daughter, Minette, whose wedding to Minette's first cousin, Philippe I, Henrietta would soon arrange. After Minette's wedding in France in 1662, Henrietta Maria returned to England, where she intended to stay. But in 1665, in the hopes of restoring her health, which suffered in the damp British weather, Henrietta Maria moved back to France, where she lived out her years. In 1669, upon the advice of Louis XIV's doctor, Henrietta Maria took an excessive quantity of opiates and died at age 59. She was buried at the Basilica of Saint-Denis, although her heart was buried in Cheyot at the convent she founded. Joining me to help us understand more about Henrietta Maria is historian and writer Leanda Delisle, author of the new book, Henrietta Maria, The Warrior Queen Who Divided a Nation, which will be released in the United States on September 6th, 2022. Hello, Leanda. Thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you for inviting me. 
Yes. So this is an exciting departure for me. I usually do American history, but I'm doing a brief detour, four episode detour into British history that I am quite excited about. So I, I'm really excited to, to hear about Henrietta Maria. Well, she's a, she is a fascinating character. And, uh, and in fact, uh, Maryland in the United States is, uh, is, named, is named after her. So she does have an American uh, connection. But um, yeah, and she's a, I think she's a figure that women from whatever part of the world they come, come from can, can, can relate to the sort of struggles in her life, and, uh, which, were, which were many and quite fascinating. Yeah. So you had written several books about the Tudor period in England, and, and then you wrote about Charles I. So what then led you to write this book about Henrietta Maria? Well, um, when I was writing about Charles I, who is Henrietta Maria's husband, um, Charles I was the king of England who lost his head, had his head chopped off. There was a civil war and it ended with his uh, execution. Anyway, so I was uh, I was writing this book and I just became increasingly fascinated uh, by his by his wife and how very different uh, the real Henrietta Maria was from the kind of black legend that has sort of grown up around her name and actually began in her in her lifetime. And I felt actually, you know, this story really deserves to be told as well from her perspective, which is which is very different from the sort of um, perspective we're used to seeing. And from the male perspective, it's a, it's very much a, a female perspective. So let's talk some about those uh, perceptions of her that started, as you said, in in her own lifetime uh, and have continued this this sort of thing that everybody thinks they know about her. So for people who maybe aren't as familiar with that, what what is this sort of this legend, this uh, perception of her? Well, uh, she's perceived, I suppose you could say it's like a cross between a witch, the witch Eve, you know, Eve who seduced, seduced Adam in the Garden of Eden, and, and a sort of Marie Antoinette figure. She is supposed to have um, persuaded Charles I uh, to become Catholic, although Britain, the, uh, his various British kingdoms were Protestant, particularly Scotland and England, and so paved the way uh, to civil war. And despite having somehow managed to seduce this Protestant king into becoming Catholic, she's also sort of supposed to be, you know, really quite stupid and frivolous, and spent her time sort of dressed in frocks. A lot of the sort of tropes used against her are are used against all sorts of powerful women. So it's it's interesting. So she's supposed to in, in the original story of of Eve, you have Eve who obviously has some kind of innate weakness that allows her to be seduced by Satan in the Garden of Eden. And Eve then goes on to seduce Adam also into betraying God. And of course, to do this, she must appear attractive, but she isn't because she is a satanic force. And so she's actually ugly. And if you think about witches and the way we've seen witches in Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, for example, the Wicked Witch. You know, she she looks beautiful, but behind the beauty is the horrible hag. And you see this in descriptions of of, of Henrietta Maria. She's supposed to be weak, and that's shown in her supposed frivolity. And that also the, the, because she likes wearing dresses, this is her disguising her her innate ugliness so that she looks attractive to seduce Charles into evil, i.e., into sort of becoming a Catholic and paving the way to civil war, all of which is sort of, you know, actual, actual nonsense. But um, it's surprising how, how quick we are to accept these sort of cliches and tropes. And I think there's another thing as well, is that there's a sort of belief that the Reformation and Protestantism on some level pave the way to our liberal democracy. There is a great sort of myth that that's part and parcel of it. And so it's also natural for us to believe that Henrietta Maria, who was a French Catholic princess, could must somehow be responsible for Charles's authoritarianism. And so I really sort of confront these myths to reveal what was who was it? this actually very remarkable woman. Yeah, and and very uh, very much a, a real person. I mean, I think that's the the thing yes. we sort of lose as we're looking at the past, thinking about these especially yes, well known so figures. True. That, no, that's so true. She's an absolute at every stage. She's that. Yes, she, exactly. She's a woman that we might recognize. So when she marries Charles, she's 15 years old. She's a child, really. She's a girl. And 
she's arriving in this um, Protestant kingdom to, to, to an adult male monarch who believes in the divine right of kings. So the idea of her being able to seduce anyone into anything is a bit absurd, frankly. But she's a really stroppy teenager. I mean, Charles had behaves quite badly and doesn't fulfill the promises that were made to her before she married him and were made to her family. I, I mean, I rather love how how she is a kind of stroppy teenager. And there's one wonderful description when they have a flaming row in bed when she asks him to do something. And he says, you know, no, he won't for perfectly good reasons. And she completely loses her temper. And she sort of says, you know, I'm miserable. It's horrible. Everything's, it's all your fault. And you've done this to me. And you could just hear the voice of sort of teenagers through the ages, actually. And then she writes to her sort of family, sort of terrible sort of melodramatic letter saying, I'm going to die. I'm going to die of misery. And how awful. Anyway, so, um, and she plays awful tricks. Um, so at one point, I mean, for not, for, 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 for perfectly good reasons, I said, Charles, is supposed to have allowed, as a part of the agreement for the marriage, is supposed to have stopped persecuting Catholics actively in England and to have, um, you know, not sort of fining them for not going to Protestant services. But anyway, he breaks this promise. And she's very cross about this, but there's not a lot she can do. But when there's a, a, a Protestant service is held in her house, she has her revenge by walking into the service with her sort of mates and stomping up and down and laughing and joking and flapping her fan or whatever. And then later, when the poor vicar is sitting in the garden, minding his own business, you know, sitting on a bench by a hedge, trying to sort of have a quiet moment, she and her sort of friends go and fire pistols behind the hedge to make him jump. And, um, (laughs) you know, it's just very kind of human. Yeah, yeah. I think one of the things I thought a lot about in reading this book is is agency. And so her agency as a, a woman in her time period, her agency as a, a mother, you know, and then all these things she's believed to have done uh, that she could somehow influence Charles in ways that actually she she couldn't and didn't. Um, but I wonder, you know, as as you've thought a lot about this time period and about the the people, you know, sort of the the ways that that she is and isn't able to sort of be her own person, express her own agency in this world that she's in, in this family that she's in, just sort of what what she maybe is and isn't able to control in her own life. She's certainly a doer. I mean, you know, from the beginning. Um, so she, when she arrives in England, uh, she has been given a sort of mission, which she does try and fulfil. Uh, and there are three parts essentially that mission. One is to sort of love her husband and to be loyal to him and his and his kingdoms. The second thing is to try and act as a protector to her persecuted uh, co-religionists, and to set a good example that might encourage conversions, and also to try and maintain uh, good relations with France. She also herself, um, which is not supposedly a part of her mission, but what she she also sees her marriage as very much in the tradition of her father's, her father, Henry IV of France's alliances with Protestant powers against the Catholic Habsburgs. So from the beginning, she does try, she does try and uh, set an, set an example uh, to other Catholics. So for example, when Charles is, is 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 persecuting them quite harshly and and not allowing them, you know, enforcing them to go to Protestant services, she refuses to attend the coronation. So she does that, which causes you know, ructions. But um, she does that. Relations with France, you know, she does her best to try and improve them. She certainly pursues a very strong anti Habsburg foreign policy agenda, which is quite separate from Charles. And in fact, interestingly, becomes the leader of a Puritan leaning faction at court, which is something people don't associate with her. They sort of think they, you know, she's been described as a kind of sort of Catholic fanatic, but actually far from being a fanatic, she has lots of Calvinist um, friends and they because they share the same sort of foreign policy agenda. There are things she can't do. She can't, she knows that she that. The sort of fantasy of you know converting her husband is unrealistic. That Charles is a very you know devoted you know has is a very strong believer in his particular brand of Protestantism. She knows perfectly well she's not going to change that, but she does try 
And she does try and not not very successfully um, to encourage him to lessen persecution of of Catholics or even stop it, she would like, but which never happens, in fact. She does manage to moderate it to some extent. Uh, But I think, again, she changes again when 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 uh, when things start going very badly wrong for Charles. She then does take a, a more active political role because she she realizes she comes to realize that her husband is is not quite the man she thought he was, and that he's failing and flailing, and um, he needs to be saved from him from himself. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. So I want to talk a little bit about sources. So uh, this is just a huge amount of information. Her life is, uh, as we've said, wonderfully complex, and there's a a lot to to put in here. So I I want to talk a little bit about sort of how we know what we know about Henrietta Maria and and how you sort of took everything that you had to synthesize into this book, a little bit about sort of your methodology of writing. Yes, my methodology. (laughs) Well, I, I had a sort of head start, of course, because I had just done this biography of Charles. And I'd also, I was very lucky uh, to be allowed into these private archives at um, Beaver Castle, which have which were closed archives. And I had sort of pretty much unique access to, to them. And they had lots of her, several of her letters in there. But I would say my methodology is I research and write, research and write. I write and rewrite and rewrite. I know some people do everything up front. I think they do all the research and then they write it. No, I, I'm not like that. I don't really know what's going to happen. I mean, I wait, you know, things unfold. I'll, 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 I'll see something, read something, discover something, then I'll go down that rabbit hole. Um, I will... I will be lying in bed or staring into space or whatever, and I will reflect on something and something will strike me. And I think that's off. That's off. So we've been told this endlessly, but that doesn't fit with with what actually I've read from the period. And so you start questioning that. Is that right? And I've done this before where you need to yes be able to stand back really and and see how whether things actually fit with what we're whether the facts actually fit with what we've been told and they don't always um, and I suppose I said and then and then the sources so now you can access for example because I was writing this book during of course endless lockdowns and um, you can get stuff emailed from example from the Louvre which um, which is absolutely amazing and there was a fantastic character description n- n- written anonymously by, about Henrietta Maria, um, you know, by a contemporary that um, I very much enjoyed, for example. And one of the things that came out for me when I was researching and, and writing this book was it was which I hadn't really considered before was that she had a great sense of humour. She was obviously very very funny, and was one of those sort of people who will crack jokes and even the worst circumstances and could have quite a sort of dark sense of humour. Uh, and one of the things, that's, again, that makes her very sort of human and um, you can understand, she could be quite naughty, like a lot of people, the sense of humour. She could Sometimes it was against, she told jokes against herself, but also could tease others, it has to be said. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I thought it was so interesting. I mean, I sort of knew this intellectually, but thinking about how interconnected all the kingdoms in Europe <laughs> were, oh, yes. it's just sort of shocking when you look at a family tree of Henrietta Maria and it's like first cousins marrying first cousins and, you know, her sister oh is the, the queen over here and her other oh, sister is the queen over here and her brother is the king over here. You know, it's like, how, how do we think about this this role in their lives of having to sort of marry as, you know, a, a way of forming alliances and stuff, but then maybe having to go to war against your own sibling? You know, what what that must have been like? Uh, I know, I know. I mean, it's it's heartbreaking some of the time. And um, I'm really glad you asked this question, actually, because um, it is a very important part of my book, this society of princes and her, her relations with her family, her mother and and her and particularly her sisters. Um, she had uh, two sisters, uh, one of whom uh, became Queen of France and who was her elder sister. And they were very close when Henrietta Maria was little and wrote sweet letters to each other. But when Henrietta Maria married Charles, all that uh, ended because, as I said, she perceived her marriage uh, as, as you know, in the... In her father's tradition of, of 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 a Protestant alliance against the Habsburgs, and her sister was married um, to you know Philip the Fourth, who was a Habsburg king. 
And then she got an, had another sister, uh, Christine, uh, the Duchess of Savoy. Um, and both these sisters faced their own civil wars um, and faced a lot of the problems that she faced with favourites, for example, uh, uh, her sister in Spain, the Queen of Spain, had terrible problems with her husband's favourite, just as Henrietta Maria did with Charles's favourite when she arrived in England. These favourites, of course, who felt threatened, male favourites, who felt threatened by the potential rivalry for influence from, from the Queen uh, and, and, and therefore tried to... And, try to you know, destroy their reputations by accusing them of you know adultery or or, or or other things. So I found I found that interesting comparing their comparing their their lives. And yes, as you say, how um things could become quite brutal. Your your countries went to war and you had to side with with your with your husband. I hope that it wasn't too confusing because this is it was it's a big canvas. Um, it is a big canvas, um, and so I hope I managed to have a, give enough life to her two sisters that you you felt that they were more than just you know names in a family tree. Because I think that's a, a really interesting part of her story. How these girls, these three little princesses, each married off as children, all of them as children. And how how they coped with the various challenges that arose. Yeah, it was fascinating. And then, of course, Henrietta Maria is doing the same thing with her own children, is trying to marry them into to strategic marriages, yes. which she's able to do with her oldest daughter, Mary. I mean, it's just it's so interesting to think then just, you know, she she sees this example of her own mother, Marie de Medici, doing this and then says, OK, and then this is my role as well to, to do yes. this with my children. Absolutely, absolutely, and also it was quite bossy, bossy to her sons, which you know, <laughs> which Marie de Medici was as well. I yeah. mean, she very much felt, you know, particularly when they were young and in their uh, teens, that her, her that that they they should ben- they would benefit from her opinion just as much as they would do from any male minister, and would occasionally give it to them with both barrels. Not that they weren't quite capable of shouting back. I think one of the things that people have done with that in the past, though, is that they've sort of assumed that. It meant that she was an unloving mother, but not at all. Henrietta Maria and her children loved each other very much, and that's very obvious. In fact, you you know you can argue with someone and love them. You can disagree with someone and love them, and uh, come together in the end, uh, which she which which she did. But yes, as you say, um, there was one, of course, James, her son James, the future James II married to her intense disappointment um married the you know the daughter of a sort of english gent you know the <laughs> Anne Hyde but rather touchingly when james married and she came over she was going to wanted to undo the marriage it was just after the restoration and then in the space of weeks she lost one of her sons died and 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 also her eldest daughter mary and after her eldest daughter's death she obviously just decided there were more important things and um and made up, which I thought was also very sort of human and very moving. You know, James, who was the who was his brother's heir after all, and should have married into a, a great royal house, had married you know little little Miss Nobody, and she was understandably because of the kind of family she came from, angry about this. But she just she's just after Mary died, she, she just sort of obviously thought, no, this is, this is ridiculous, and um. And became quite close to Anne Hyde. Yeah, and uh, you know, uh, as we're recording, I have just been away from my own children for a week. They're they're with their grandparents, and you know, so I I was every time she was separated from her children, especially while they were still very young, you know, because she has to go into exile in France, or you know, they're they're taken somewhere else. It was just kind of heartbreaking to think that she clearly had so much love for her children, and yet had to spend so much time away from so many of them throughout their lives yes and when they were so little yeah that was so, that's so awful yes i mean her her the baby she had an abandoned as a newborn baby at one point in 1644 in exeter which she obviously found horrendous um and 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 what was so awful as well she was getting these breast abscesses you know obviously because you know when your breasts well she wasn't going to be breastfeeding but when you have milk obviously you know and so they had this kind of physical Results. So every day she would have known not only the mental anguish, but she could actually feel it in her body. I think must have been so 
well, it was clearly. I mean, you know, it was described very clearly as how dreadful it was. And she had two other little children who were throughout the Civil War who were captives of Parliament. And one of them she never saw again, which is her daughter, Elizabeth. And it's heartbreaking, the letter she wrote after Elizabeth died and died in Carisbrook Castle, where Charles I had been kept prisoner for a while and with sort of rather unsympathetic and unpleasant guards. Yeah, absolutely terrible. Yeah. I actually have a ring. I had a a great grandmother, believe it or not, who collected Stuart relics. And I actually have a ring that belonged to this girl. No, that belonged to this girl, Elizabeth, and has her her hair in it because they dug her up in the 19th century. And, you know, anyway, it was a fashion then, rather awful. But (laughs) that's an aside. (laughs) And so uh, I think the other thing then that I wanted to to talk about is uh, this idea of Henrietta Maria as generalissimo. (laughs) Oh, yes. And that she, she seemed to have actually really good instincts in in battle in in strategy and war that you know i think is not the thing we think of typically with queens that you know that's what you're thinking of with kings so i I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and how she got to be sort of in this position that that she got to exercise some of this yes i know it is absolutely extraordinary well uh, as i said uh poor old charles he needed some help when she she left (laughs) she, she left england in 1642 on the eve of the civil war and uh, the parliamentarians gave her a passport to leave, really because they wanted to get rid of her because they realised that she was actually too, you know, she was too powerful an ally of Charles, and they wanted her out of the country. Um, but actually, this proved to be a great mistake because um, she went to Holland, where she sold many royal jewels and managed to, with some difficulty, because you know, obviously obstacles were put in her way as much as possible. And also these jewels were worth millions, the equivalent now of millions and millions and millions of pounds. And because there was a political aspect to them, it was quite difficult flogging them. But she managed to do so, to buy arms, to pay uh, for men. And she had to, you know, again, then sneak these arms into England. And they basically saved Charles that year because he was expected to lose the first battle of the Civil War and he, he, he survived it. Following year, she came back to England with more arms, more men, but essentially her own army, and um, went to the north of England. Charles was in the south, south, southwest in Oxford, um, where his capital was. And you know, she sat on a council of war with the Earl of Newcastle, who was the sort of leading general in the north, royalist general, and she helped persuade parliamentarian gen- a leading parliamentarian general, one of the three top parliamentarian generals in the north to turn coat and and had several military successes and charles eventually insisted that she came to join him in oxford which uh, she did taking the town of burton on trent on the way in what was described as a bloody and desperate fight interestingly when she took this town the women took part in the fighting they you know and there's you see this quite a lot in the civil war making them making bullets um and and so forth and and then of course occasionally they would become victims of war as well because the the, the, the victorious soldiers would take revenge which is some one of the obviously you know war is, 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 is obviously dreadful and dreadful things happen but anyway so she went to oxford and she was desperate for him to win the war that year before the Scots, you had to remember England and Scotland were under the same crown, but they were separate countries, separate kingdoms, independent of each other. And she wanted Charles to win the war before the Scots joined, because when when the Scots joined, she knew that the balance of numbers would be tipped against him. And London is rioting that summer. London, Londoners want peace. And she says to him, you know, you must use my, you know, all this extra power and I've brought you now and take London. Now is the time to take London, win the war. And he ignores this advice and goes and besieges uh, Gloucester. And it's a moment that she returns to and people return to again, again in the years ahead. And is even mentioned in her funeral oration as the sort of great turning point when Charles, you know, has made, you know, a massive mistake. So he misses the opportunity to take London and the Scots join the civil war on the parliament side at this point. And, um, you know, you have the great battle of Marston Moor um, in 1645, um, which, you know, was a massive defeat for Charles. And it's really like a sort of terrible deflating balloon, you know, everything's going downhill. 
Henrietta Maria has gone back to France by then to try desperately to keep the show on the road with still raising money, still raising men, still getting arms. But, you know, she can't save him ultimately. So if he had listened to her all along the way, would he have won? Well, I don't know. I think you can't know that. You can't know these what ifs. But he certainly didn't. I mean, he didn't. He didn't win by ignoring her advice. That's for sure. <laughs> yes. I think what is interesting is not so much whether I don't know whether taking her advice would have helped him. But is that what is interesting is how respected she is by both sides at the time. Of course, the parliamentarians hate her. Lots of people hate her. She's a French Catholic, you know. And also, she, it's, it's very useful to blame her for stuff. That it's, it's useful to say, oh, look at Charles. He's being run by the Pope, you know. But they res- one of their marks of respect is the, is the really quite serious attempts they make to kill her. I mean, they really do try quite hard to kill her. And uh, which I don't think they'd bother if, 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 you know, if she was a sort of useless bit of fluff who was just sort of leading him astray. Then why? Why try and kill her? I mean, you know, on the contrary, you know, feed her. You know, chicken and chips twice a day to keep her alive and healthy. So that's one thing. And 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 all and on the royalist side as well, you have all sorts of different characters who go to see her when she arrives in England in 1643, in the middle of the Civil War, because they say that the king, the king's, is basically he's he he he's 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 not he's he's, he's not firm in his positions. In that he flip flops, um, whereas she's much more reliable um, and. Um, much more sensible, and they go and see her. And even people she argues with, like Prince Rupert, Rupert of the Rhine, who also opposed this retaking of London that she had suggested, grows to respect her. And uh, when she leaves Oxford to return to France, you know, is is extremely uh, upset about it. Yeah, so she was good at working with lots of different people. I suppose another th- thing in, in the civil wars you had, I said, you had people switching sides, and. When Earl Courtiers, who had been friends and had betrayed them in 1642, changed their minds, people like Henry Holland, Henry Earl of Holland, whose brother, I may say, was one of the people who tried very hard to kill her. Um, when he when he sort of um, defected to the royalist cause, you know, she welcomed him with open arms and was prepared to, you know, to, to do a lot for him because she realized that would encourage more defections. Whereas Charles wouldn't. Charles was like sort of. Yeah, he couldn't really swallow that pill as easily as she was prepared to do as she, as she could. Yeah. I find that quite interesting as well. Yeah. So I want to encourage everyone to read this book. So can you tell everyone how they can get a copy? Oh, right. Yes. You can buy it from, I think, any good books, any good bookstore, Barnes and Noble or or wherever, um, online or um, in your local shop. You probably have to order it. I mean, if you're, I don't know, if you're somewhere very remote in the middle of Idaho or something, they might they might not realise that you would be interested in reading a book on Henrietta Maria. I don't know. Um, or there's, you know, Amazon. So any of the any of those sort of usual places where you might be able to get a book. I mean, as I said, in some places you probably have to order it in. I don't know, but it shouldn't be too difficult to get, I hope. <laughs> yeah. I'll put links in the show notes so people can can find it that way as Thank well. Thank you so much. Yeah. Is there anything else that you wanted to make sure we talk about? Well, I was very pleased, as you said, as you were mentioning her sisters. Um, I suppose, yes. So there's also some quite f- fun things that I enjoyed writing about was her rivalry with Cardinal Richler. Now, I quite love the whole, you know, Duma, Three Musketeers thing, um, which you definitely have some of that at the beginning. But that, of course, is, involves principally Buckingham, uh, the, the Charles's favourite. But after he's assassinated, she becomes a sort of really Richler's, one of Richler's leading enemy in support of her mother, who um, detested um, Cardinal Richler. And I think... You have, you know, you have all the the, the spies, uh, the you know, the, the and and sometimes moments of farce as well. I think actually in intelligence, you often get moments of farce. People think I think things intelligence works all very serious, but I think inevitably there's, there's always a certain silliness that you can't escape from. And people sort of say that there's a wonderful scene at one point when the French, uh, when Cardinal Richelieu's agents break into the house of a, of, a, of a French spy living in England and and um, just say there were a casket of letters under their cloak. And I don't know, I, don't, I mean, I enjoy all that side. I enjoyed all, the, all that as well. And I, I hadn't realised actually 
just how important the, her enmity with, uh, with Cardinal Richelieu was. I mean, that Richelieu was was blamed, being blamed for uh, supporting the Scots when the Scots rebelled against Charles, and even for being involved uh, in backing Parliament at the beginning of the Civil War. And um, I found all that actually quite fascinating and unexpected. Yeah. Well, I loved learning about Henrietta Maria. I thought this was it was just a great book. I really enjoyed it. And uh, it's been excellent talking to you thank as you. well. So thank you so much for, for joining me. Thank you. Oh, can I ask you one question? Sure. What was your favorite bit? What did you like best? I really liked, when, especially when she was younger, the the masks that, that she was in. Oh, Yes. So especially before they before they said she couldn't talk in them anymore. So I think it's maybe the first one she's in in yes. England when she has a speaking role. And I, I just love that that image of this this queen <laughs> being yes. up on stage performing. And actually, do you know, I think what was what was so interesting about um all that um is that even after she was stopped speaking, she encouraged plays that centered on female characters and they became very fashionable and this encouraged i think women in england to feel they had a right to a political voice and so when the civil war came this fed into fed into the politics and you have very much have women on both sides really feeling really being politically engaged as well as literally making bullets and and some of that i think came from a culture that she encouraged yeah yeah, I love that. Right. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. This was wonderful. Thank you very much. Bye, everybody. Thanks for listening to Unsung History. You can find the sources used for this episode at unsunghistorypodcast.com. To the best of our knowledge, all audio and images used by Unsung History are in the public domain or are used with permission. You can find us on Twitter or Instagram at unsung underscore underscore history, or on Facebook at Unsung History Podcast. To contact us with questions or episode suggestions, please email kelly at unsunghistorypodcast.com. If you enjoyed this podcast, please rate and review and tell your friends. MSW.